I love doing my podcast and I get to speak to so many amazing people with different stories, things that they've done, things that they haven't done. But this week is a bit different. This week, I am talking to Emma Jane Taylor. Now, Emma Jane runs an amazing business. She's all about lifestyle and fitness and dance and entertainment and all those sorts of amazing things. But she's got a story and she shared that story. And it's about child abuse. So we talk today about child abuse and how Emma Jane is championing the survivors. We're trying to talk more about it. She set up a charity, the 9010 charity, to help survivors and to educate all of us and protect the children. It was a very, very difficult conversation today, but Emma Jane is absolutely delightful. She is amazing and she made it so easy for me to talk to her. We had a great talk before the show and and again afterwards. I'm going to have her back because she is absolutely brilliant. If any of these things that we discussed today have affected you, please get in touch with Emma Jane. She is lovely and she'll help you too. So without any further hesitation, let's dive in. Wow. Good morning. We are live. I say good morning. It's afternoon already, isn't it? Uh, Hello, Emma. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Great to be here with you today. Great to be here with you. And and thank you so much for coming on. And this is going to be a really difficult conversation for me today because, um, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you let everybody know who you are and tell us a little bit about uh, what you do? Hi, Ashley. Well, um, hi, everybody. So my name is Emma Jane Taylor. I am the founder of a series of lifestyle businesses. So professionally, I'm involved in performing arts with children um, as young as three to add to to 18. And also I work in the fitness industry. I'm very passionate as well about both of them. Um, And we work with adults up until, I don't know, 104, uh, even older. Um, So my industry is very much geared around well-being. Um, And that is looking at how the body works, how the mind works um, and sort of putting it all together from a performance part. I'm a dancer by trade. um, And so fitness and dance is very much a big part of my personal life as well as my professional life. Uh, I also do a lot of mentoring and training with corporates and here in the UK and around the world and have clients um, that I work with as their mentor, helping them get through blocks, difficulties, whether it be mental, emotional or physical, uh, working together. Um, So I've been in that industry maybe 25, 30 years now. Um, That's something that I love. I have a great team of people that work with me um, on both businesses. So we are flat out constantly, as you can imagine, um, with that work. Um, And what we're going to talk about now, of course, is probably more about my campaigning and my charity. So seven years ago, I decided to speak up and out about my personal story of being abused as a child. And I think it was at a point where I felt a bit of an imposter, actually. You know, my I was sort of sat in my business and um, loving my work. Um, and I was working with, uh, at that time, I was also presenting with That's TV as their presenter on the Wellbeing Show. And every week I'm interviewing people thinking, I just I feel a bit of an imposter because so many people have gone through such difficulties. And so have I, actually, but I've never talked about it. So I tiptoed in, started speaking up, started speaking out, got invited to speak at um, a football stadium. um, And there was about three, four hundred people there. And it went into a magazine. My story went into a magazine. They bought it, promoted it at this night. I was comparing this night and shared my story. It was the first time I'd ever done it. I felt actually sick when I spoke Mm. um, on that stage because it was a really, really big evening. My parents were there, my friends were there. My story had gone on the screens around the football stadium. It was, it was totally overwhelming. I'm thinking, what am I doing here? Mm. <laughs> what, what, what did I think this was a good idea for? Yeah. I kind of figured it could car crash my career, but actually at that point I was like, I just need to let this out. I need to get it out. If it could help one person, then it would have done more than enough. 
Um, and so I spoke out and shared my story. The year later, I published my book. And I didn't really have any expectations beyond that. Um, it didn't car crash my career in many ways. It made things much better because I could be me. I could be authentically me, you know. Um, I know that word authentic gets used a lot, but it's true. You know, I really could just be me. And here we are seven years later. Um, I have a campaign that's gone around the world. My movement has sort of taken hold in pretty much every country around the world. That's called hashtag not my shame. That was um, a movement I accidentally launched sort of two years ago. I have a safe space at the moment for about, we have about 600 survivors in the safe space on, on a private group on Facebook that's managed by some incredible people, Sharon, uh, Lynn, uh, Joe and Kelly. They look after that space with me. We have a team of moderators and that kind of looks after it. It's only for people who've gone through uh, trauma as a, um, as a child. And then I was also looking at, you know, what could I do in the charity world? What what can I take forward through my own lessons? And so Project 9010 was uh, launched. Well, we went live last year. And now I have Project 9010, which is a charity focused on education. And we're looking at educating young people on helping them understand language, what to trust, what's appropriate, what isn't. Uh, looking at we we have a we our training plans are called PAC P A C K PAC for life, um, and that's looking at permission awareness communication and knowledge. So we don't actually work with kids, by the way. We work with the safeguarding teams. They take it forward into education for children. So in a nutshell, Ashley, um, that is my world. We, my world is sort of long days because everything is just full on from, I mean, I'm coming to the end of my professional season um, now. We had to take a break um, before it sort of all starts again after the summer. But it's full on. I love it. Would I change it? No. Um, I feel kind of privileged to be here now today in everything that I'm doing from charity to, to my professional life and also how it all works together you know you really sort of look at it and you go actually it does work together from the work I do with the children through to the adults in performing arts and fitness that's all all of that is sort of my whole life my whole world that's where I started those were the things that helped me uh, unknowingly at the time but those were the things as a young performer I performed professionally um but I didn't realize how impactful they were until sort of later on in life so uh that's my life Ashley and um I am pleased to be here to continue this conversation with you today so thank you for having me no, fantastic. I think that's the, the, the longest ever introduction. Um, there is loads, there is loads to unpack there, EJ. Absolutely loads to unpack. Um loving the lifestyle, the 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 um um you know the mindfulness, the the, the healthy stuff. But we want to dig into your story. We wanna we wanna you know showcase 9010 and, and, and what all that is about and get a bit more comfortable talking about what happened so please share some of your story of, of you know what you shared that night and, and what your book was all about please so I uh, grew up um, with my mother and stepfather every other weekend I would visit my father I had siblings and step siblings around life was pretty good you know it wasn't complicated I had a cat called honey and had some nice friends and yeah, I think, you know, as a young person up until sort of around nine nine years old, life didn't sort of, I didn't, I don't remember it not being good, you know, it was just a nine year old, uh, you know, a young life. And and then I went on holiday, my parents, my mum well, and my stepfather, when I was uh, around nine, we went to Greece and we would go to a restaurant um, quite regularly where we made some friends and it was fun and the waiters would smash plates and we'd go dancing and 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 go see the animals so another so some of my favorite things here are dancing fitness and animals nature as well um but every night we went the waiters would take the children outside to see the animals and I'm like yay let's go you know and you'd be outside you could hear the party and the smashing of the plates the music the dancing and it just it was a warm night it was always felt nice but 
particular night, um, one of the the own, I think it was a restaurant owner, not waiter, and he took me away from the other children. But of course, I'd already bonded with him over those sort of like the time we'd been there, so I trusted him. Why wouldn't I? I didn't know not to, right? He's, I mean, was just he's, a child. He's a, he's a grown up. You're going to trust him, aren't you? He's a grown up, and that's what we're taught, right? We're taught to, you know not be rude to people we know we're we're okay we should shout and scream if a stranger did that but not yeah, someone danger. we know and that's a really important part of the work that i'm doing so um he took me away from the 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 friends that i'd made and he uh, sexually assaulted me now that incident was an isolated incident. I, it never happened again because I think we probably came back from our holiday quite soon after that. I don't really remember what happened. I just remember running back into the restaurant, running into the bathroom and shutting the door and, and someone was trying to get me out. But that was it, that was it. That was an isolated incident. Um, so fast forward a couple of years, it was a weekend to see my father. I uh, loved my dad. He was really just brilliant fun. I, you know he was that he was the handsome prince he was the dad everyone wanted you know and then on their way to um horse riding he pulled into a lay-by and said that there was a difficulty in our relationship um and that uh, you know i had to consider you know a couple of options and then the next day he called me and couldn't, told me he wouldn't couldn't see me anymore now i was around 11 12 and I, my world actually fell apart. I, I, I found out what broken heart meant um, because actually when he said he didn't, was, he couldn't see me again, he really meant that. I is never this, saw him is this, again. Is this because you, you were with your mother? It was a complication really. I think, you know, both my dad had, you know, I was performing at the time. I was a professional uh, young performer at that time and I was always busy. And then he was doing the horse riding with me. And then this weekend to see him, the next one was falling on Mother's Day. And he wanted, it was my weekend with him and he wanted to see me and he made, and I had the decision of, you know, did I want to stay with mum on Mother's Day or see him? And and, and he saw, on the call, he said, look, if you, if you, if you can't see me that day, I can't see you again. But he meant it literally. So obviously Mother's Day, I'm like, I want to see Mark. And but obviously, actually, that's it's a really long call that would be because there's obviously a lot of other stuff involved. But anyway, mm. the bottom line is, don't ever do that to your kids. Don't ever give your child an ultimatum. I couldn't mm. make a decision again for years and years and years personally, because wow. I wasn't sure who I would lose next. So, so, so he broke my can heart. I, can, I, can I just interrupt there a second? So you're going to horse riding, you've got a weekend with your dad, you love your dad. I've, I've got two daughters and and, and the, 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 the father-daughter relationship is incredible. Um, so I, I totally get, I totally get where, where, where you are. And he just turned around, that, that that's it, we're done. And, and and that was it and then yeah, off, well, off. yeah i mean i actually remember the call and he said have you thought about mother's day and i said yeah i really want to see your daddy but you know it's mummy mother's day and i want to see mommy and i remember mm, and he mm. said well look you've made you've made your decision you were um, 11 11 12 yeah yeah and like i say up until that point he was the dad everybody loved he was mm, handsome mm. he was funny he was like so funny i mean like just brilliant but uh he'd married again had another family i think it, maybe there was just lots of complications but the bottom line is people do not do that to your kids um they are children you are adults and you need to find a way through right you need yeah, to make whatever it about the kids. whatever whatever stuff has got going on you've got whatever stuff's got going them. on you've got to put that to one side and put your kids first mm, anyway yeah. My life fell apart that day. Mm -hmm. um, broken hearted was how I existed, really. And it took, for, for all sorts of reasons, it, I struggled. Um, but I also was very vulnerable. And that vulnerability um, made me a new friend. Um, and he came to me, uh, someone we knew, someone was in the family, and he came, showed up, right time, right place. Um, and I bonded with this adult 
um, who groomed me and then abused me for the next three, four years. But, you know, when I look back, there was all sorts of upsets because of what my father had done. Um, and not just to me, but to my other, my my siblings. But of course, that's their journey. They, they want to talk about that. And so there was a lot of upset, a lot of noise. I think it I went under the radar because of the upset that I was going through that anyone was doing anything else to me because it, the, the waters were already muddied. And um, so when I suffered at school, when I suffered and started drinking and taking drugs and smoking and getting it suspended and everything else, everyone just blamed it on the fact that my father had left me, which um, of course is true, right? I mean, I was I was just I was broken. I, I, you know, and then of course the reality of what happened at nine flagged up. So I started to feel dirty, and I became quite obsessive about cleaning. And I, I have to have a bath every night before I go to bed and clean. Um, and so there were lots of things that were sort of flagged up, but everyone just assumed it was because I was a broken-hearted child which I was, but there were obviously other things going on there that needed to be considered and they weren't. And that was a big problem for me because I just went completely under the radar. So that sort of like those years, nine to 16, seven years really, of just really sort of uncertain, insecure, vulnerable times um, that affected my life and I was abused, but also my mental approach to relationships, emotional approach to relationships trusting people and, you know, finding a way that I could exist in a world with other humans without fear of sort of being hurt or, or, or dropped or damaged or abused. And that takes some time, right? You get, it took a long time for, I'm 51 now. Um, and I think, you know, I can sort of look back over the last 10 years and think it's probably the last 10 years that I've started to stabilise on this and not think that everybody's going to hurt me or, you know, say goodbye. And that That is tragic. That is tragic because you missed the best part of your life, the, four, the, the you know, up until up until you were 50. Uh, sorry, 40, 40. So you, in the last 10 years, yeah? We, we don't see that when, when, when we hear we hear about children being abused we don't see that and you know you you let, let's say you went off the rails um because you you didn't have any guidance you didn't have you know you, you didn't know who to trust you didn't know who to believe and you were just trying to find your way and cope in any any way you you you, you needed to and so that friend of the family robbed you of those 40 years well I'm sure if you spoke to anyone who'd gone through abuse, they will say the same. The friend of the family or the family member or the person that taught them, they've taken years from a person. And I often say this abuse, child abuse, is tantamount to murder in many ways because you've taken that child. Mm. And, you know, when I think... I don't really remember too much before the first assault when I was nine, but I do remember just those long, hot summer days with mm, my friends mm. enjoying. We had a cat next door called Scamp, and I always remember I can smell Scamp, and it was just, I don't know, happy days, right? I mean, mm, mm. happy days, um, and instead of which I've had to sort of really fight my way to exist in my world as Emma Jane Taylor. Um and thankfully, I got to a point where I feel stable with it. Um, but so many people don't, Ashley. And, you know, that's why I decided to stand up and, and fight, because it, it shouldn't be this way for any of us. Yeah. And, and that's why your T-shirt says, not my shame, because it is not you. But when I, I've, I've recently read a, an amazing book uh, called Enough. And, you know, it, it, it just seems that all these young children that have been abused, they think it's their fault. Um, the the abusers are very clever, manipulative, you know, manip manipulative. I can't even say the word manipulative. Um, you know, and and, and the, the poor kid doesn't know any better. They think that's that's how it should be, and they just blame themselves, and they've got all that shame. So how how have you overcome that? Have you had counselling or anything, Emma Jane? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I've had counselling. I was when I was about 13, I was thrown into psychiatric care by my school because they labelled me a juvenile delinquent and they were going to expel me. My mum was like, please don't expel her. You know, let's do what we can. But of course, everyone still thought it was the fallout because of my father, which it was. But it was also much bigger than that because of the abuse. So um, I went into this psychiatric supports um that the school offered but i don't think that was very helpful really because i wasn't able to truly share everything um can, can I, it was can I ask, why couldn't because you know look at looking now you you sort of like think you've just been put into juvenile delinquent can't you just turn around and go oh yeah the only reason i'm here is because i was abused and it's this person and why why can't you say that what how, what were you going through can you remember well it's really traumatic when you are um going through any kind of abuse as a child and when you kind of look at children's development you know long, young minds don't really fully develop until late teens early 20s mm, some say mm. 30s now the impact of what's happened to us in childhood whoever you are whether you've gone through abuse or not you tend not to speak out about people right you're scared you don't want to sort of upset the apple cart when someone has been abused for an amount of time and years um there's feelings there's mm. emotions there's the bonding there's you've been groomed um and you've probably heard the tra word trauma bond before but you've got this trauma bond so you, you know, you don't want to speak out against someone who um, you've actually got a relationship with. And I use that term very loosely, but that's what they've done. They've manipulated the situation. So they've got your trust. And if they don't have your trust, they can't assault you, right? They can't abuse you because um, you're not going to show up, right? So, you know, they've got to mould you into a way that's going to make it easy for them to abuse and that means they've got to show you um the nice side of them and actually that's a very very complex part of this conversation is the nice side to them because they aren't nice but as a child that's what they see so you're not going to break that bond so you're not going to speak up about it and that's why i speak up now because we need to help young people um understand that you know that's not the right way forward. It's not an acceptable behaviour by any adult to a child. And we need to help children be protected because of it. Mm, no, absolutely. And and look, uh, full disclosure, I've got a little grandson. And, and you, you're just like, I cannot imagine anyone doing anything to him. But we have to safeguard our children. So you've you've gone you've gone through the ringer and you're 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 you know you from from the outside everything looks absolutely amazing you're, you're running a great business you, you keep smiling you're a very smiley person so it's lovely to have you on the show but so what are you doing and how do we protect our children and our grandchildren and, and what, what should we be saying to them and, and things like that well i think firstly thank you for having this interview with me today on this because it's not a subject anyone really likes to go near because of fear and i know that you were nervous mm. about it because it's a scary conversation um knowledge is really important understanding um, the impact of abuse is really really important um so what can we do now talking about it listening to conversations understanding the reality of abuse so anyone who's gone through abuse will have gone through all sorts of hoops of fire to become a young adult into an adult um, and so if they're talking to you about their story it's not about giving advice it's not about switching off it's about leaning in and I you know it's a, it's, that's a word that people don't like to use these days you know authentic and leaning in but we really need to you need to mm. you need to allow people to be authentic we need to lean into this conversation and we need to understand the importance of empathy not sympathy I mean it's this is about empathy and empathy will help you better understand what people have gone through I talk about my my story which many my Thing actually that's like talking about my story but others will be going through something different right so I listen to them and lean into them when they're talking so that's sort of from a survivor point of view really really understand the difficulty because like you say you've had a childhood taken the child cannot flourish as they may 
or they should have done because of the restrictions they've been uh, given because of being abused, stunted. I mean, for me, it was um, a, a late development of maturity, uh, paranoia, um, OCD. I was bulimic, um, full of all sorts of disorders and addictions to trying to cope. So I couldn't actually flourish. I'm here today as a woman in business and I've had that opportunity to because I've had about 20 years of therapy to get to this point. Who knows where my life would have gone if I hadn't have gone through the abuse. But so many people can't get that far. So that's the adult side from the children's side. We need to look at how can we protect children? Well, um, there's the obvious one, the phone. I don't know if you saw in the news today, there was a big story about that today and how... Um, an 11 year old was um, was groomed online and she had pictures sent to her. She sent pictures. They've gone everywhere. They, no one knows where they are. They're just a huge. And, and of course, now it's led, led to physical abuse. So that phone, um, I spoke to a 16 year old a couple of years ago and she said she wished she was never given a phone at seven years old. Well, you want to give a phone wow. to a seven year old, then most the adults don't know how to use like, their phones, right? And you're asking a seven year old to have. Are you muted? That literally links to the whole world. Don't take, don't give a child a phone. Help them with the phone, right? Until they're 16, they're still seen as children here, right? So talk to them about what's going on there. Help them understand the reality of if you're going to share a picture, whatever it is. I mean, even a nice picture can be sent to a million people quite quickly yeah. and could end up in the wrong hands. And do you want that? I mean, do you want that? I, mean, I, I see people putting their children publicly on posts on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook and LinkedIn. And I think, oh, they're really nice. But actually, right, they're public. You don't know who's going to take that picture of your child and take it into the dark web. And God knows what will be done because of that picture. So you want that? No, I, I don't think any of us want that. So those are the things. First of all, be cautious of the phone, be cautious of technology, help your child with technology, help your child understand. Um, you're not actually allowed, children aren't allowed Facebook and Instagram um, until they're 14. Um, I still think that's too young, but a dear to that, right? They're, they're still, still children. children. A dear to that. Don't let them have this technology too young. Um, and then you've got the conversations around, well, you know, the work that we're doing with the charity, what's permission, what's awareness, what's communication, what's knowledge, the pack for life. What does permission mean? You know, have that conversation with your child because it's going to be different for every family. It'll be different for, for you as a parent and other parents. But, you know, I was taught to scream and shout if the man in the white van stopped and tried to get me in. Sorry, um, men with white vans. Um, but that's what I was taught. And even today, Ashley, if I'm walking on my own and a van pulls up, I do get a bit, oh, wow. And of course, it, they're, they're innocent, right? But that was yeah, what yeah. was drummed yeah. into us, stranger yeah. danger. Yeah. The reality is the 90-10 statistic, um, it's considered that 90% of children being abused are being abused by people they know, yet we educate 10% stranger danger. We're in the 21st century. We need to flip that conversation. Mm. I would. I was never told to say no to people that I knew and loved. Um, so, so you're understanding what permission means, how to have it in a way that is right. Have that conversation in a way that's right for you, your family, and your child, um, and help them to be aware of conversations, but in a way that's not scary. Right? You know, it's permission. Permission could be as, as simple as you know, can I can I borrow your pencil? or can I have a hug, or can I have, you know, just gently. So children aren't fearful, but they're, they're smart early on on mm. conversations that will expand as they get older. Uh, being aware of your surroundings, being aware of where you are. Um, if you're going to drop your eight-year-old child into town, do you want them walking down the back alleys? Do you want them walking out on their own? Do you want them, you know, getting on a train to London? Of course you do. Um, well, I mean, I'm saying this, but I would not imagine most people wouldn't. No, no. Um, so just have those conversations and, and what it looks like, but in a way that's not terrifying, because we don't want kids to be as scared of people that they know and love. We need them to be smart and savvy around people and humans. You know, when you look at the news today, I mean, 
Every users, they, they, they're hidden in plain sight everywhere, right? So just be smart about conversations you're having with your kids and lean in and empathise to anyone who's telling you about their abuse. Oh, lovely, lovely. So if someone's listening to this and they've had something horrible like this happen to them, how can they get in touch and, and um, how, how can you help them? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. It's quite sensitive, my me. I've got my face. Um, my uh, website is emmajanetaylor.com, www.emmajanetaylor.com. If you go there, you'll find everything about my work, everything about um, my own story, my journey, and also all the social media that um, I'm on. I'm on everywhere. You can choose your fancy um, about where you want to follow me. Oh, perfect. Um, Emma. I'm afraid half an hour isn't long enough. Um, wow. But, but it's yeah, we, bridge, isn't it? it? It has. Thank you so much. Um, I feel a lot more confident talking about um, child abuse now. And uh, I'd love you to come back. Um, and, and I want to hear all about the happy times. Um, you, and because there have been, there have been happy well, times. Yeah, well, you, like I said, you keep smiling and, and you're doing oh, well, I think I'm, And I'm, and I'm now engaged and going to be married in, later on this year. So, you know, I got there in the end. I did trust in, and find my own love, find love. No. Good, 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 good. That's, uh, congratulations on that. Um, sharing your story, has that been part of the catharsis? Is that something that you would encourage other um, survivors to do? Or is it best if they keep it locked away? So I have a disclaimer on this. If you go on my LinkedIn bio, you'll see there's a disclaimer on this. And I, I don't encourage anyone to speak up until they've better understood who they are, what they're doing and why. Because it can be, uh, you know, my 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 work is, has uh, been seen more and more, which means that it attracts more and more people. And then with that, you attract more and more trolls. Um, and so trolls I couldn't probably have dealt with 10 years ago. Now I'm like block move on um but you will once you start speaking out not everybody is going to agree with you not everybody is going to like what you have to say but you've got to be prepared for that right and actually how will you deal with that if someone disagrees with you or what you're saying um like i said i mean i can i can pass it by these days um i wouldn't have been done i wouldn't have been able to 10 years ago so it's not glamorous being on a stage it's not glamorous being on the TV or writing books or so on and so forth. The reason I do it is because the end goal is to reach survivors, make a difference, get the conversation seen and to protect. Ultimately, my end goal is to protect children. So I know what I'm doing. No. Be clear about what you're doing before you do anything that could car crash or triple your world in, in that you, you could speak out too soon and it could be very damaging for you. Yeah, no, but I'm so glad that you did because we wouldn't be having this conversation and hopefully this has made people be a little bit more aware of it. Um, Emma Jane, thank you so much for coming on. I just want to um, uh, just introduce uh, my guest next week. Um, totally different conversation next week. I'll be talking to the cheerful HR consultant. Um, so we'll be chatting to Nikki a bit good uh, next week. Um, and tomorrow, because I didn't didn't have this amazing guest, um, I'm talking to Yvette Fitzhenry, who is going into social media in a big way. So we'll be chatting to her tomorrow on my other show. Um, Emma Jane, thank you so much for coming on. Um, leave us with a word of wisdom before we say goodbye. Uh, being sexually abused is not your shame. It never has been. The shame falls so, solely at the perpetrator's feet. And that's a conversation not just for survivors to get their head around, but also allies. And the allies um, will be of great value to this conversation if they can just do what you're doing, Ashley, and lean in and um, understand and share the knowledge so that we can protect children today and into the future. Oh, what a lovely way to end the show. Emma Jane, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you to everybody who, for watching. Um, all of Emma's information will be in the podcast notes. If you're listening to this on the podcast, then get in and uh, gain contact. Thank you very much indeed. Cheerio. There we go. That's the end of another show. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed it, please subscribe, start downloading and tell everybody else 
that you like this podcast. If you want to reach out, if you've got any questions, I'm always on LinkedIn. I'm the 15 minute guy. You can find me dead easy. It's Ashley Leeds. And you can find me on my website at www.just.15mins.day. And on there, you'll find loads of free resources and ways to contact me and book a meeting with me. So thank you very much for listening. See you next time. Bye bye. You get out what you put in. Never gonna lose, never gonna win. As long as you're happy, you're always gonna grin. 